So welcome everyone. Um, so my name is uh, Sam Hurst, as I've already said. That's my Twitter handle um, and that's the hashtag for the course, so Romancing the Gothic. So if you're live tweeting or you're wanting to comment on uh, the experience today, then please use the hashtag, tag me in if you like. I love to see how people have interacted with the class and how they've used it, etc. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about 18th century ghost tales. And it's worth noting right before we start that 18th century ghost tales are a different beast than the ghost stories that we're more familiar with, that we maybe trace back primarily to the 19th century and such writers as, as Poe, for example, Dickens, Gaskell, and then later people like M.R. James. Now, we're used to ghost stories um, which are sort of centered around tension, uncertainty, and predominantly fear. We're also used to ghosts which are sort of richly layered with meaning, often performing allegorical functions as well as literal functions. So we're used to ghosts which are remnants of a past which cannot die, for example. Um, we're also used to uh, haunted houses, uh, ghosts that plague the house, as sort of representations of the uh, lack of safety of the domestic space. Uh, ghosts can perform the function of the fear of the other. So we're used to ghosts often as palimpsests of different meanings um, and sort of this quite rich tapestry. But again, all connected through these discourses of, uh, if not fear, then uncertainty. But in the 18th century, we're getting something different. As you see, we're not going to be talking about ghost stories in this sense. Ghost stories created primarily for some form of entertainment. Instead, we're going to be looking at three different types of ghost tale, which were quite popular in the long 18th century. So there's gonna be a couple of mentions of the late 17th century as well. So in the first part of the class, we're going to look at anti-Sadducean literature and those collections of uh, ghost tales and supernatural tales. I'm gonna take you through sort of what these were doing, but I'm also going to share with you some of the, um, a number of stories which represent some of the most famous and popular uh, tropes or types of ghost tale. Um, in the second part, we're going to be looking at some of the real ghosts of the 18th century and investigating events or sightings, which were uh, sort of very widely publicized and debated within the 18th century. And in the last section, the shortest, um, we're going to be having a look at the ghosts of folklore and ballad. So just to be clear, um, I'm not going to be looking um, in depth a lot of the oral history of folklores. We do have another speaker in January, I see uh, Sedgwick, who many of you know, who is going to be coming and talking to us about folklore in the north of England, and she'll probably be touching on quite a few of those things, but they are quite difficult uh, to track down in the literature. What I'm going to be looking at um, is sort of uh, the overlap between folk creation, specifically folk ballads, and the 18th century penchant for collecting and categorizing and systematizing these ballads. But when we're looking at folklore, we're going to be looking at a tradition which I think um, we should look at more in connection to the Gothic, but we're going to be looking at a tradition which hasn't in any sense died, uh, remnants of which are very much still active today. Um, and you'll see what I mean about that when we get to that section. So let's start ourselves off with this idea of the anti-Sadducean text. Um, now, just as a sort of brief kind of background to what's going on here, and if you uh, want to know more about this, then the other ghost lecture goes into it in a lot more detail. But what you've got in the post-Reformation period was originally um, a sort of rejection of the ghost um, by Protestant theologians, because it was considered to be a sort of Catholic uh, belief, both supporting and supported by a belief in purgatory as an in-between state from which ghosts or the spirits of the dead could return. So in the post-Reformation period, there was a complete denial of the ghostly um, among Protestant circles. And instead it was replaced with the dominological interpretation, which means that ghosts didn't exist, but perhaps they were evil spirits. But by the end of the 17th century and into the 18th century, a new threat is arising, much more vivid and important for people than Catholicism. Although Catholicism still uh, was considered to be a threat, as I've also talked about in another talk. <laughs> Um, but the threat of atheism and deism to uh, the Church of England or to Christian belief more broadly was a, a key issue. 
And so we start to get being produced these anti-Sadducean texts, these texts which use supernatural events, um, particularly uh, depictions of the ghostly, to combat some of these Sadducean tendencies. And I'll go on to what I mean by Sadducean in a second. So this is one of the prime examples of that. And it's a great example of Sadducean literature, anti-Sadducean literature, because it's right there in the title. So Joseph Glanville's 1681, Sadducismus Triumphatus, um, or the triumph over the Sadducees, effect effectively, um, is perhaps most famous, or you might know it in connection to witches. But it was a book which also dealt with apparitions and other supernatural um, entities as well. And we can see it as part of this project of investigating the supernatural and moving away from a denial um, of the supernatural in order to combat or as part of this fight against um, atheism and deism. So what do I mean by anti-Sadducean and what do I mean by Sadducean? Well, when we talk about the Sadducees in this context and this use of the word, it's worth noting that we are not talking about in any sense a nuanced and well-informed um, conception of the actual Jewish theologies of this particular sect in the uh, sort of BCE period. But instead um, it's borrowing from and then sort of universalizing as an idea, um, this idea of the Sadducees that comes through in the gospels. So in the gospels, we have that comparison between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Today, perhaps we're more um, familiar with the term Pharisees and Pharisaical, usually uh, applied to kind of concepts of a rigid legalism, often mixed with hypocrisy. The Sadducees, as we find in Acts 22, 8, the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit. So a religious group which were denying resurrection, angels and the spirit or soul. But the term Sadducee in the sort of 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th centuries comes to be synonymous with the denial of or a challenge to the existence of various kind of key tenets of Christian faith. So an immortal and a material soul, uh, a Christian concept of the afterlife, the resurrection of the end days or the judgment day, and even the possible, possible divinity of Christ. Because in denying the soul, um, this becomes to some extent a challenge of a Trinitarian uh, theology where uh, Christ is entirely human and entirely divine at the same time, because he is but material, he is but human. Um, so I'm going to give you some examples of how the term continued to be used all through the 18th century, although there are sort of uh, changes in the meaning as it came to be applied um, to different groups. Um, and different particular doctrines, although always we're rotating back to the fact that it's challenging these four key things. So Lord Shaftesbury, who was himself a deist, arguably, in 1711 and his characteristics, defines the Sadducee as a materialist and denier of the soul's immortality. So we're going to find again and again that these anti-Sadducean texts, these collections of ghost stories, really place an emphasis on the idea that ghosts can prove the idea of an immortal soul. Um, we have it, this term occurring in lots of different contexts though, um, in things that are much more satirical. And the satirical poem, The Frightened Farmer from 1742 in the London Magazine, is the story of a man riding home drunk at night and there's something on his back. There's something poking and prodding that won't leave him and he rides faster, but it won't won't leave, he can't escape, uh, but it turns out to be a monkey, classic. So it is a satirical poem, it is mocking his superstition and credulity, but we also have this term Sadducee being used and the idea that the modern Sadducees, according to this writer, talk of mere illusions, strength of fancy, long prejudice and early fears, notions imbibed in younger years and a gross deception of our senses. So all of these uh, reasons that are being given for discounting ghosts, the medicalized and psychologized ideas that were becoming kind of discussed and more widely spread in the 18th and 19th centuries are here being tied to the idea of the Sadducee, the denier of the resurrection angel and spirit. Uh, we're seeing this term and, and its relevance still appearing in the 19th century, interestingly, in the work of Byron. Um, so you can see how common a term it was. Um, Byron in Child Harold combines classical imagery with this sort of Christian concept, saying, if as holiest men have deemed it, there be a land of souls beyond that sable shore to shame the doctrine of the Sadducee 
how sweet it were in concert to adore with those who made our mortal labors light. So here, there's something quite interesting going on um, to my mind, or something interesting to highlight, perhaps. Um, we have this idea of the Sadducees as, as, the, as those who deny the idea of a life after death. But we also have this very clear conception of the idea of the ghostly, or the idea of that uh, life after death as something which can bring spiritual comfort rather than fear. Uh, the last usage <laughs> that I'm just going to mention briefly is one of my favorite drags in uh, 18th century uh, sort of discourse wars, uh, which was a 29-page satirical poem called The Sadducee aimed at Joseph Priestley, who uh, was perhaps the most famous Unitarian uh, of, in history, but certainly one of the founders of the Unitarian Church. And it was addressed to him. So um, the idea of the Sadducee was being attached at this time also to particular religious groups. So the Unitarians were, uh, had Sassinian beliefs, which meant that they did not believe um, in the divinity of Christ, for example. And Joseph Priestley was a strict materialist who denied the possibility of a separate soul. So we've got the idea of what these Sadducean texts, what Sadducee is. So what are these anti-Sadducean texts and what are they doing? Well, I'm going to give you, uh, there's lots and lots and lots of them, but we're going to be working with just a few of them. So uh, let me introduce you to some of these few. Um, John Aubrey's Miscellanies from 1696, not 1796, apologies, um, is a uh, slightly different than the others. So John Aubrey is something of a collector of curiosities. What he is not producing is a didactic text which goes into a great deal of detail um, about these stories. He's not trying to make a point about theology uh, specifically. He doesn't have a large discourse, but instead he is collecting all these tales together. But ultimately this collection of tales does serve the function of um, engaging people in a discourse with the supernatural because he's presenting these cases as to be discussed not as proof of anything but as material for discussion to hold open the possibility essentially uh, of supernatural belief. Um, now the second two are actually the same but different publications so in 1727 Daniel Defoe published quite in quite a small way an essay on the history and reality of apparitions or quite a low-key way um, and then it was republished in 1728 as a universal history of apparitions. Um, now this was a sort of much more direct anti sadducean text. What's quite interesting here is um, in all of them you're going to see the use of apparitions, but Daniel Defoe is the most direct about uh, moving away from the idea of ghosts and towards apparitions, that demonological interpretation that I suggested. So he's a little bit suspicious uh, at, later on in his life as well as he, as he goes on, he becomes more and more suspicious of the idea of ghosts as uh, spirits of the dead, but he does view them as spirits, potentially, potentially evil entities. And so they still are able to prove things like the possibility of an immaterial uh, soul or entity. Um, and the last one from 1758 is Life After Death. Quite short, quite sweet. Um, it's, it's a really fun one. Um, and it is collecting together a lot of the stories that have already appeared in others. And it has a very didactic framework. And we're going to look in a second um, at what it says it's doing as a sort of good example of what this anti uh, these anti-Sadducean collections are attempting to do. But first of all, what I'm going to do is come out of my uh, PowerPoint for a second. I'm going to go into uh, some PDFs because I thought instead of cutting and pasting and sort of getting bits and bobs on these slides, what I would do is just show you some of these texts as they appeared, how they were set out, and so that you can get a feel for what they were trying to do and how they were organized. So stop share and reshare. <laughs> Here we go. So hopefully you should be able to see um, John, um, John Aubrey's miscellanies here. So I'm going to take you to the top of the screen. So John Aubrey's Miscellanies is a really interesting collection of different things, as you can see. Um, he's not simply collecting together stories of apparitions or ghosts. He's also collecting stories of voices, impulses, knockings, corpse candles, oracles, fortune telling, transportation in the air, 
Um, and as you can see, it's not a long uh, collection. It's quite an easy read. But let me just give you a sort of idea of how he was putting these stories together, because one of these key differences between the 18th century ghost tale, what we're seeing of ghost stories emerging in the 19th century, is how they're written and presented. Because here you're not having this attempt to build a narrative of tension, as we will very, very clearly see right now. So you can have a look here. This is the chapter on apparitions. And you can see the first one, he's drawing examples from uh, classical texts. He's taking examples from different existing books. And he's also taking letters and testimonies that his friend have, take, uh, have, have sent him within the book as a whole. But what we see here are some of those classical examples. And it's very brief, very plain, no attempt to build a story whatsoever. So Cynthia, Propertius's mistress, did appear to him after her death with the beryl ring on her finger. The end. That's it. Um, it's just being sort of listed almost. So some of them go into more detail, but it's the detail of a witness or observer rather than somebody trying to tell a story per se. Um, I love the one on Augustine. Augustine affirms that he did want to see a satire or demon. Zero details for that one. Um, so let me show you something perhaps a little bit more interesting, which is the Defoe. And Something that I think is uh, interesting about this first edition is the sort of respectability politics involved in this particular image, because this is, of course, is an example of uh, one of the classical stories, uh, so Roman or Greek, in this case, Roman stories um, about ghost sightings. So it's producing this kind of respectability by appealing to the classics. Um, and so saying, you know, this isn't just something about, you know, uh, peasants and folk belief. This is, you know, a thing. And uh, behold, I'm using classical examples, very serious. Um, but let me show you as well what we can see about what was in this text. Uh, so I'm looking at the second edition here just because the setup's a little bit cleaner to see. Um, what was being contained in them? What were they trying to say or do? So we've got the contents here. Um, and you see that it's a universal history of apparitions, sacred and profane, whether angelical, diabolical, or departed souls. So you're certainly getting all the way through this, that uncertainty for Defoe. And as I said, in his later sort of work, he does move away from the idea uh, of it being a uh, departed spirits, really. So uh, the first part is going to talk about their various returns to this world with sure rules to know if they are good or evil. So the question isn't so much about whether they can possibly exist, um, but the question of their nature, these apparitions, these sightings that people have. Um, he then has an inquiry into the scriptural doctrine of spirits, then the different species of apparitions with their real existence, the nature of seeing ghosts before and after death. Interesting there, this idea of ghosts as wandering souls, perhaps even before death. The effects of fancy, vapors, dreams, hippo, and the difference between real and imaginary appearances. So you're also getting this engagement with the medical um, and psychological, proto-psychological discourses of the time. And what we'll see as we go through the 18th century is that more and more types of ghost sighting or vision were um, made understandable scientifically, but not all. And then there's a collection of the most authentic relations of apparitions, particularly that surprising one attended by the learned Dr. Scott. And likewise, Mrs. Veal's appearance to Mrs. Bargrave and George Villiers to the Duke of Buckingham. Also, the notions of the heathens concerning apparitions. Heathens here referring simply to non-Christians, and that's where he does include the sort of classical discussion as well. But what you're seeing here is he's going to be providing a collection of stories, and he actually dots stories all the way through. But these stories are being used essentially to prove a point. Uh, well, that's his expressed intention for them anyway. And you can see from point two that he's very much engaged with this idea of putting forward a theology in what he's doing. So the last one, I'll just have a quick look at that uh, frontispiece here for life after death, or the history of apparitions, ghosts, spirits, or spectres. Got a lovely woodcut there. Um, I think it's George Villiers and uh, the Duke of Buckingham, but I could be wrong. And uh, we have this quote from Addison, Joseph Addison from uh, 1712, I think. It says, stories of ghosts and apparitions deserve to be taken notice of as they contain a most certain proof of the immortality of the soul. So there's two really important claims that are being made in this epigraph. Firstly, that ghosts and apparitions deserve to be taken notice of. 
that these uh, stories should not simply be dismissed out of hand, but should be investigated. And also, again, reiterating this point that they should be investigated, they should be explored because they have uh, theological valence, that they are important to understanding the world and uh, our concepts of theology. So uh, let me take you back here. So let's have a quick look at life after death specifically and what it says it's doing and why it says it's being produced. So it says, why should we believe? Um, uh, the author, the anonymous author notes that a person who looks upon the stories of ghosts and spectres as fabulous must, I think, be an atheist or deist. It's quite clear uh, what the suggestion is here. Um, that if you don't believe in ghosts, you're denying so many things that you might as well be an atheist or deist. Um, he also says that the holy scriptures abound with authorities in support of them, and nor is profane history less copious in the like accounts. So one of the, the regular arguments in these ghost debates was the idea that, well, if you say that ghosts don't exist, if you say that spirits don't exist, or prophetic dreams don't exist, then you are defying and denying the Bible. And a lot of this discourse round around the question of the witch of Endor, and I'm going to do a separate class about that in the new year for you. Um, but I welcome questions if you have any. Um, so there's also, he's saying, you know, there's historical records for all periods of time and all places, there are records of spirits. So there's a profane history as well, um, which is copious. So why would we deny it? Um, he's also saying that this is not simply a, a thing of the past. So he's quickly dealing with the possibility um, or the arguments about the cessation of miracles in the post-Reformation period. Saying, you know, this isn't just a thing of the past. This isn't something that stopped with the early church. Um, they are almost every village in England can produce recent and undeniable proofs of these supernatural visitations. So the point that he's making is tied uh, to the theological, but it's also interesting to us as a sort of uh, form of evidence or at least suggestion of the continued proliferation of ghost stories in English society at the time. Now, there's also certain ideas that appear in these collections of what ghosts are doing and what they're here for. So one of the key things that's frequently underlined is this connection between ghosts and providence. Ghosts aren't just here. They're not just returning of their own volition, bobbing around, haunting a house, being kind of emotionally traumatized and unable to leave. No, they're permitted or even sent by providence for specific purposes. So for the discovery of a truth, perhaps a hidden truth or something as banal as the discovery of some treasure. Quite frequently, they're linked to the exposition of some horrid crime. Um, and some of the most popular stories are those of murderers uh, being haunted by their victims. They also perhaps serve a function to warn the impious and guilty persons to avert by a timely repentance the vengeance of heaven due to their offences. So these ghostly uh, visitations are also seen as perhaps being a, a possibility for change. Now, um, the last sort of uh, quotation or idea that I'm going to, to show you before I go into some ghost storytelling is uh, from the History and Reality of Apparitions by Daniel Defoe, who you may know obviously as the writer of uh, Robinson Crusoe or more Flanders, depending on your preference. Um, but he makes the point that what this book is trying to do is not simply to make you believe in ghosts. Um, it's not to kind of thrust you from the arms of atheism into those of superstition but there is a challenge. How to bring the world to a right temper between these extremes is a difficulty we cannot answer for. But if setting things in a true light between imagination and solid foundation will assist towards it, we hope this work may have some success. So that's sort of the aim uh, of what is occurring uh, for him, this treading this middle ground with these stories. So, let me tell you, I'm going to go through five stories. Four of them are ghost stories and one is another sort of supernatural tale. Um, I'm going to introduce them to you. By telling them, I am going to be uh, sort of naturally bringing some of our modern conventions about ghost storytelling with me. Um, it is worth noticing, noting that though, the idea that ghost stories uh, are essentially quite fluid <laughs> um, and uh, Many of the stories that we find in these books were retold in subsequent editions or became part of popular folklore. Um, but 
we are, we have very different conventions for ghost storytelling and some of that uh, will apply in how I'm telling these stories but the narratives themselves um, as you'll see were pr presented in a specific order and again not to build up tension not to build up fear the emotion that they perhaps sought to evoke in support of their arguments is more one of wonder surprise or awe sort of weight of evidence where you're like oh my gosh Ghosts must exist. So the first type of story, I'm going to tell it and then go into the type that it is. So it centers on a British soldier who is just returning from Ireland in 1690. And um, in a sort of very common move, his colonel with the usual solicitude of the British upper military classes sees that this soldier is somewhat upset. He's getting thin weary he's he's wasting away and he seems to be ashen complexioned and racked with anxiety and so he asks him what's wrong man what can I do to help you in this situation the soldier at first is unwilling to answer but after a moment after a decision he says to Colonel, I will tell you, for it is a relief to my soul. I was once a servant, and worked for a rich man. This rich man and I used to travel together, traveling alone, and he would take with him great wealth in both goods and money. And one day the temptation grew too great. And as we traveled, I killed him and buried the body. I also buried the treasure. I was overcome with guilt. I fled to Ireland, joined the army and became part of the colonizing and occupying force of Britain in Ireland. He didn't say that bit. I'm adding that in for context. Um, but he did say that he ran away to Ireland. But now, since I have returned to British shores, everywhere I go, I am followed by the ghost of my master who says over and over and over again, wilt thou not yet confess thy wicked murder? And so it is a relief to tell of my deed. So after this confession, he was arrested and put in irons. Um, the colonel uh, or a party went to dig up the body and it was found exactly where he described it. And so um, the soldier was punished. Essentially, he was placed uh, within a cage and it died. <laughs> he was uh, hung in chains. So this particular type of story is that of the murderer punished by their own victim. So a number of ghost stories in the period had this idea of divine justice being acted out by the return of the ghost. Now, this could manifest as it does in this tale by the, the haunting essentially of a guilty conscience. Um, and it's worth noting here as well that, as I've already said, that idea of the guilty conscience and the psychological explanations became more and more important. And you'll find by the end of the 18th century that these particular type of stories um, are already being discounted as supernatural um, because they are being counted as, you know, he's just haunted by his own guilt. But still at this period, uh, right at the beginning of the 18th century, this is being represented very clearly as a supernatural tale. Um, we do also have, this is in the collection Life and Death alongside a number of other stories. So um, uh, the, uh, talking about murderers being caught because of supernatural action. So one of them is that classic of uh, the murdered victim. Uh, his hand begins to bleed upon the, uh, the, the murderer when the murderer touches him. Uh, this is a sort of classic uh, test for murder even where uh, the idea was that the body would start to bleed in the presence of the murderer. And we also have ones where um, um, the murderer and even the murder was revealed to a third party through the apparition of the ghost. Um, one thing that this story really brings to the fore and it will kind of, it's worth bearing in mind all the way we go through is the fact that yes, ghost stories often uncover histories and we find this to some extent, perhaps, uh, definitely in American Gothic literature and perhaps in American go uh, ghost stories. I'm not as familiar, obviously, with that context. 
But certainly in England, there is as much erasure going on as there is revelation. Um, so, so in contrast in England, there's definitely, well, I don't know if it's in contrast, but in England, there's certainly an issue with erasure going on instead of uh, sort of revelation. So if we think about this story particularly, what is being revealed is a murder, is a crime. But what is being completely erased by this are, are completely sort of pushed out of the frame and its relevance pushed out of the frame is uh, the work of this man as an agent of British colonialism and imperialism in Ireland involved um, in sort of violent action. So um, within England more generally, there's a good question about what ghosts appear, um, what sort of folkloric ghosts, what real ghosts are meant to appear and which ones are raised. And I talked about in this, uh, this morning, one of my colleagues, Ali Edwards, works on ghost tales, um, and she was, uh, she has mentioned to me many times the fact that, of course, in England, uh, there are very, very few, if any, uh, ghosts of people of colour, which are, which are mentioned. This despite sort of thousands or hundreds of years of history of uh, black people and people of colour within England. And so you've got to think about, uh, oh, it's an interesting thought that yes, ghost stories might reveal some history, but they also manage to hide it as well. So the next story, this is one of my favorites um, of all time. Um, and this picture doesn't quite fit because it's got a man and a woman in it, but it should be two men, but I couldn't find that. So um, this particular type of story, the most um, famous example of it is the Duchess of Mazarine and Madame de Beauclair. So you might be aware of that story. And if you are, this is a bit of a spoiler. But this is the story of people with terrible names, um, which I hadn't read out loud until this morning. So apologies um, for the names here. But um, this is again collected in uh, Life After Death. And it's Mr. James Douche's account of the apparition of Major Sydenham to Captain William Dyke. So the doctor talks about that one day he was going to visit a sick child. And on the way, he called at the house of his cousin, a military captain. When he was going there, having a chat, and he said, oh, this is where I'm going tonight. And the captain said, oh, I'll come with you. I had to go there anyway. So they arrive at the house, the child is treated, but it's late and they're going to stay over. And so, and I quote here, they were seasonally conducted to their lodging, which they desired might be together in the same bed. This is, of course, is a representation of the fairly common practice of bedfellows, but where people are sleeping is continually important in this tale. But anyway, they're sleeping in the same bed, or they're meant to be. Um, they're probably having a chat, having a relax. And then at some point, the captain gets up and pours himself a glass of wine and starts to get ready to leave and go outside. The doctor, unsurprisingly, is surprised and asks him, where are you going at this time of night? And the captain says, do you remember my major? Do you remember my friend, Major Sydenham? Um, we used to talk about, we used to debate about God and the soul all the time. And we made a pact that whichever one of us would die first, then the other would return within three days at midnight in the specific spot here in the gardens. And so I'm going to meet him. And the doctor tries to dissuade him and he says, you shouldn't test God like that. You shouldn't test his decrees or his justice or the reality of his word in this way. You're just begging for the devil to come and trick you. But the captain says, no, for I gave my major my word that I would go and I will not be held back. So he goes to the garden and he sits in the garden house and he sits there and he waits for a man that never comes. He waits for two and a half hours and then he returns inside. And then the story jumps forward six weeks where the doctor once again met the captain, this time as the captain was taking his son to school uh, to leave him a, a sort of boarding school. And again, they stay in the same place, this time in an inn, but they are no longer sharing a bed. Um, the next morning, the doctor awaits the captain, but he's very late in coming down. And when he does come down, he's haggard and shaking. And the doctor says, sit, what has possibly occurred? At which point the captain says, and I quote, I have seen my major. The doctor goes to sort of uh, poo-poo this idea skeptically, but 
The captain continues and says, as I lay in bed, I heard a voice calling to me, Cap, Cap, the name that he had for me. A hand pulled open the curtain and it was him. And I said to him, what, my major? And he said to me, there is a God, a very just and a terrible one. And if you do not turn over a new leaf, you will find it so. But the ghost doesn't leave after delivering the warning. Instead, he continues to pace around the room, walking and touching things. There's an interesting aspect of corporeality here. At one point, he goes to pick up a sword and it's his own sword that the captain has kept. He turns and he looks at the captain and says, it is not in quite such good repair as it was in my day. And that's when he leaves and the captain goes downstairs to tell his friend of what has happened. And that brings about a sea change in the captain's life. And he becomes a very pious man. So um, you might recognize this formula of the pact, this idea of the pact. And this is a very early example of it, but we keep finding these stories of the pact through these anti-Sadducean texts in the 17th um, and, and 18th centuries. And it's obviously become also a literary trope. Um, this is probably one of my favorite versions of it. Um, but there's also this idea inbound in it that it is a tempting of fate, that it is an impiety to, uh, to make these kind of packs. Don't do it. Uh, so the next type of story here, we have um, a, uh, an interesting little mini story. So Lord, this is in 1647 that this originally occurred, but this again, this appeared in the miscellanies from John Aubrey. Have the story of Lord Moen's son who had a quarrel with Prince Griffin. And they arranged to have a duel randomly, and I've not really heard of this before, but maybe it's very common, on horseback. This is the only picture I could find of a horseback duel. So they arranged to have this uh, duel the next day. Moen rides to the duel, but on the way he's met by a group of men who um, pick a quarrel with him and shoot him. The question, of course, is, was it of their own volition or were they there working on behalf of the prince who believed that he could not himself win the fight? But for our purposes, what's of interest is the ghost. And you'll see this lovely woman here. Uh, this isn't the actual lady, but I thought it was a nice picture of a courtesan with a sheep. Um, in Covent Garden, a woman who is described as his sweetheart and both plain and, uh, sorry, beautiful but common, or handsome but common, she wakes that morning and sees him come into uh, the bedroom. Oh, draw, well, she sees him, uh, she hears him come into the bedroom and sees him draw aside the curtain at the bottom of the bed and simply look at her and then leave. And it turns out, of course, that that was at the exact moment of his death. So there's an interesting aspect uh, to that story there. And this idea of appearing at the moment of death or just before death is quite a common uh, feature of these ghost stories. Um, it's an interesting one because it moves out of that framework slightly of ghosts being allowed for providential return because it's not so much a return as it is a slight lingering in order to finish up business or to say goodbye to those with whom you have a soul sympathy. Okay, uh, this one, as you can see, did not end well. <laughs> <laughs> so in this story, um, it's a story of uh, a man in Ireland, interestingly, who had a dream. And in his dream, uh, he saw his cousin riding to Ainsbury in Wiltshire. And he saw him robbed and murdered in his dream. So he was quite shaken by this. And he wrote a letter to the, man's, to the man and his wife, um, sent the letter including a description of the event and a detailed description of what the men looked like and were wearing. The man who received the letter ignored it, obviously, thinking, okay, you had a dream, weird, uh, thanks for the letter. Um, but then a few days later, he went out and he was in fact robbed and murdered. The wife was shaken both by the tragedy and by the coincidence of the letter and showed it to some friends. The description was so detailed that they began to look for the men described in it. And these two men were found and it was revealed due to their equivocal and contradictory testimony 
and the fact that they had several of the murdered man belongings, that they were in fact the murderers themselves. And they too were hung in chains. So here you have this idea of the function of the ghost uh, to provide a warning, sometimes for an event which can be averted and other times for an event which cannot be averted. So we've seen two types of warnings. In the pact, it was able to change his life and change his path. Here it's a warning which was um, just simply ignored. Okay, and the last story is just my favorite. It's got no ghosts in it, but it's a really fun story from one of these books. Um, and it's all about a snowball. So settle in guys. Um, this is a story about uh, Thomas Glover, the ambassador in Istanbul in 1611 of all times. Now he's just there running his ambassador, uh, running his embassy. Um, and it's the middle of winter and his servants began as you do to have a fun snowball fight between themselves and with the Janissaries or uh, Turkish soldiers. But some people were obviously gaming a bit too hard. And one of them threw a snowball with such force that it hit the man in the eye and killed him instantly. So I don't know how hard you have to throw a snowball for that to happen, but I imagine very would be the accurate description. But unfortunately, the man dies. And of course, the Aga, or the leader of the Janissaries, is deeply upset that both he's dead and nobody has been punished or even drawn up for it. And so he appeals to the Grand Vizier. The ambassador says, oh, it was just an accident. Uh, you know, you can't blame these British people for, you know, accidentally killing one of your guys. But the Grand Vizier says, I don't care if it was an accident. Somebody needs to be punished for this. But the question was, who threw the snowball? But at least six of the Janissaries got together and they said it was a new man or a man newly arrived called Simon Dibbins. But the ambassador knew that this wasn't true because Dibbins hadn't been in the area on that day. But Simon was already taken in and he couldn't do anything to get him free again. Bribes didn't work. Reasoning didn't work. And so Simon was going to be executed for the crime. Because the ambassador thought, well, I'm just going to give up. It's better that one man should die than that we should create some kind of civil unrest here. On the day of the execution, um, he sends a chaplain to get confession. Uh, to take his confession so that he can have uh, sort of the last rites. The chaplain goes. And here's his confession, at which point Simon Dibbins reveals that it has all been an act of providence for he is a murderer, which is exactly the reason why he fled from England. So everyone is delighted by this news because yay, um, the man who killed somebody by mistake by sort of pistoning a snowball through their eye socket, he gets off free and we've killed a murderer. See how great providence is? Amazing. Uh, so that, that's that story. Um, so just to finish up this section, uh, I'm going to take you through just one last thing. So I said at the beginning that I was going to look at anti-Sadducean literature and sceptical texts. So we have the curious case of the sceptical collection. So what we find in these anti-Sadducean texts is they have this explicit purpose. Um, it's often uh, sort of theologically informed. It's to prove the existence of the immaterial soul, but they also function as collections which would often be read in part for entertainment. There's very few people who would read the snowball story and begin a detailed debate on natural versus, uh, uh, versus active providence, for example. Um, so these stories become a form of spectacle and entertainment in themselves, passed down and read repeatedly. Now, in these skeptical collections, Theoretically, they have a directly opposing purpose. So in John Ferrier's 1815 essay on the theories of apparitions, this is one of the most skeptical texts you can find. And he goes through all of uh, a load of different stories and he presents a, a, a theory which is based uh, a sort of on medical understandings. And this uh, text is essentially to disprove the possibility of apparitions and visions in the present day or real supernatural visions in the present day. But 
the question can be asked about whether it actually achieves that function in relation to the tales that it tells. So it does produce some of these arguments, of course it does, uh, some of which were very popular and widespread, but the stories themselves don't function to quell disbelief. And this buildup of stories essentially uh, continues to maintain an engagement with the possibility of the supernatural. And also this idea of reading these tales to some extent for spectacle and entertainment. So I'm just gonna give you an example of two of the stories that he told about the same person. Um, and then the sort of arguments that he gave to try and uh, undo this storytelling in a sense and move us back into a rational framework. And you'll see for yourselves whether you think it's, it quite covers it. So these particular stories are about a, a Highland Scottish chief um, with the second sight. So obviously this is engaged um, a little bit in the idea of this kind of the mystical uh, Kel and this idea of the sort of othering of these other parts of Britain. Um, but what we have is a story where we're, we're given a sort of proof for it. It's attested to by a military man who is known to Ferrier's family and he was the witness of these events. When he was staying in Scotland, he stayed with an older man who was renowned as having the second sight. And it was said of him that one day he had seen an apparition on the battlements and had never again been cheerful. A little bit Hamlet-y. Um, one day, as they're sitting in the room, he takes on the look of a seer, staring off into space. And when he comes out of his seer moment, he sends for the servants and sends two servants out to two different houses in the neighborhood, asking them to inquire for the ladies of the house. So everyone is confused and asks why. And he says that he saw a, a little woman come in through the door with no head, and from uh, her size and shape, she could only be these two women. Now, um, later that day when the servants returned, it, it was revealed that one of those women had died of an apoplectic fever at about the time that he told the story, uh, that he revealed what he had seen. So there is a second story about the same man where he was indisposed and the, uh, the military friend was reading to him. There was a storm outside and the chief was worried about his people. And suddenly at one moment looked into the middle distance and said, the ship is lost. Well, our military inquirer once again asked, well, why would you say that? He says, because I saw two men bringing in another dead between them. A mere hours later, that is exactly what happened. So those are the stories that he tells and the introduction to these stories, which is set to disprove them is he says, people of a sensitive nature are more likely to see visions. So there is technically speaking a medical explanation proffered, but seen as it doesn't engage with any of the details of the story, their effect I would argue is perhaps allowed to linger. And certainly they're allowed to stand as stories provided mostly for entertainment. Anyway, it's time to take a break, maybe have a snack, maybe ask some questions. So let's come out of screen share. Um, so let me just stop recording for a sec. Resume recording. Okay, so um, the second section um, is on real ghosts in the 18th century. And I'm going to start, ironically enough, with a fictional ghost. <laughs> so um, many of you might have heard of the true relation of the apparition of one Mrs. Veal to Mrs. Bargrave. Um, it's a story that was published in 1706. It's attributed to Daniel Defoe, who keeps coming up for us. And it's a really good example of what we might call a factional ghost. So factional, um, on that borderline between fact and fiction. Um, and we can place this within the uh, literary context of the time, the development of the novel, and uh, the, the novel at the time was still a form which was uh, finding its feet and borrowing from uh, preceding and contemporary genres. So uh, the from the romance, for example, from the medieval romance, uh, also from uh, travel writing, uh, from uh, aesthetic writing, from uh, all sorts of different types of often factual writing, which were mixed together. And if you think of novels like uh, Gulliver's Travels, for example, or even Robinson Crusoe, they tread this kind of factional line because they appeal to uh, this uh, illusion of reality. And we find with Mrs. Veal that it was also one of these tales. It was published as real. 
and understood uh, by some to be real, although now we would understand it to be largely, uh, it's accepted that it's a fictional story, uh, in part potentially written to be included um, in Charles Drelling Court um, as a cons Christian consolation uh, for the fear, uh, against the fear of death or Christian's defense against the fear of death. Uh, it's a French uh, writer, French book. Um, very, very popular in the 18th century. But um, I'll go back to, to that uh, and why people might think it was written specifically to be published within that collection. Um, but it's important to sort of see how this text was presented. And I'm using it to start us off thinking about real ghost stories because what it essentially produces is this, uh, it's a really interesting echo of the way in which these real ghost stories or real ghost debates about specific hauntings played out in the 18th century. Um, it's also quite interesting uh, as a sort of thing to tie in with the later development of the Gothic fiction and the ghost story. So it's often referred to as sort of the first almost modern ghost story. It's not quite, and I would say it has more connections to that early Gothic literature, um, but we are seeing a move into the creation of a narrative. Um, the attempt to make write this as a, as a story or as a tale. Um, so with the other ones, the way I was telling them, sometimes I was making them more storified, but you could tell from the order that there's not a sense of tension about revelation. It's more a question of like, oh, why is the ghost here? Um, there's not a question of like, is there a ghost? Is it going to get me? It's simply a question of, oh, there's a ghost. When will I confess? Um, whereas what we have here is this uh, deliberate creation and narrativization of this ghost story for consumption. The tie-in uh, with the early Gothic for me is because of this use essentially of a frame narrative of producing a, a ghost story, which you are framing as factual, as we find in the Castle of Otranto, for example, or the Italian by uh, Anne Radcliffe. And you can see from this long quote here, that it's both being represented as factual and certain like key points being hit again and again and again to vouch for the story. So we're told it's attended with such circumstances. So evidence is being given for it where the, uh, the respectability um, of the witnesses is being appealed to, one of them's a justice of the peace. Also, our pro the proximity of the witnesses to the event, the proximity, excuse me, of this account to the original account, as it is here worded, um, within a few doors of the house. We're also having the witnesses and the main characters being vouched for, um, both at the level of being reliable witnesses, they have so discerning a spirit as not to be put upon by any fallacy, but also uh, vouching for their moral character. So Mrs. Bargrave, we're told, had no reason to invent and publish such a story, to forge and tell a lie, and she was a woman of much honesty and virtue. We also have the framing of this tale being didactic, but what we're finding, as I've suggested, is a narrativization which is also engaged in the aesthetic. It's attempting to uh, create a particular affect as well. And it's being created and written in a specific way to produce specific effects, but also to create a particular kind of uh, narrative. It's not about fear, as you'll see. It's more about Christian comfort. But there is this didactic frame to it, as we can see from this quote, the use which we ought to make of it, i.e. the story, is to consider that there is a life to come after this and a just God who will retribute to everyone according to the deeds done in the body. And therefore to reflect upon our past course of life we have led in the world, that our time is short and uncertain and that if we would escape the punishment of the ungodly and receive the reward of the righteous, which is the laying hold of eternal life, we ought for the time to come to return to God by a speedy repentance, ceasing to do evil and learning to do well, to seek after God early, if happily he may be found of us, and lead such lives for the future as may be well pleasing in his sight. So, as we can see here, this uh, text has these theological purposes that we're used to. It's the idea of pointing towards a life after death, towards a, a system of providence, i.e. a just God, um, who will both reward the righteous and punish the guilty. And also um, it's connected as well to this uh, later trend that we'll see really coming to fruition in the, uh, the graveyard poetry, this idea of, you know, reflecting on our mortality and his grasp, the shortness of our lives in the face of the eternal. 
But what is the story of Mrs. Veal and why do I keep talking about Drelincourt, this guy here, and his Christian defense or Christian consolation against the fears of death? Well, this is a very popular book, um, which uh, went into a discourse about the immateriality and immortality of the soul. And that was our defense against the fears of death uh, to a great extent. Very, very popular, reprinted uh, almost 20 times, I think, in the, in the 18th century alone, even though it's written by a Catholic author shockings. Um, it was well regarded among a number of different denominations. Um, and it plays a really bizarrely key role in the true relation of the apparition of Mrs. Veal if there is no connection between them. Because um, basically, let me tell you uh, what happens and you'll see at what point uh, this book becomes key to the narrative. So the story revolves around Mrs. Bargrave, who is a respectable woman with um, a less respectable and abusive husband. Now, um, as she she's a little older than the woman who grew up next door uh, or near her, Mrs. Veal, but they were firm friends and had vowed that that friendship would last forever. But Mrs. Veal uh, never was never married, so the Mrs. There is honorific, but she was a maiden lady living with her brother, and she was subject to fits. But the reason that their friendship became a little more distant was because Mrs. Veal's brother got a job that took her away from uh, Mrs. Bargrave. However, although they hadn't seen each other for over a year, one day on the 8th of September, I believe, at 12 noon, there was a knock on the door of Mrs. Bargrave. And at the door, she found Mrs. Veal looking pale and weary and tired. They greeted each other with great delight and Mrs. Veal leant in to give a salute, but her lips almost touched Bargraves, but did not. She leaned back, put her hand to her forehead and talked about how weary she was. She said to Mrs. Bargrave, I'm off on a journey, but I couldn't leave without coming to see you. They sit together and start to have a cozy little chat. When out of the blue, <laughs> Mrs. Veal says, Drelincourt is the best writer about the afterlife. He knows more than anyone else about it. Do you have a copy of Drelincourt? Maybe we could read some Drelincourt together. Let's read it together and talk about it. And so that's exactly what happens. They spend over an hour uh, reading the Drelincourt uh, and discussing it. And Mrs. Veal delivers various homilies to give encouragement to Mrs. Bargrave, who has a fairly miserable life at this point as well. At one point, Mrs. Veal also asks, you know, she indicates her wan looks and says, do you think that my fits have mightily impaired me? Which Mrs. Bargrave politely declines to, to uh, discuss or declines to uh, agree with. After she asks this question, Mrs. Veal gives instructions to Mrs. Bargrave to write a letter to her brother about the distribution of some rings, some money and some cloth. Mrs. Uh, Bargrave at first is uh, uncertain about why she would do this, but she doesn't want to upset her friend and so agrees to do so. Then Mrs. Veal asks to see Mrs. Bargrave's daughter and Mrs. Bargrave goes out to find her daughter. But when she returns, Mrs. Veal has already stepped outside the door and says that she has to leave, that she might see her on, uh, that she might have to go on her journey on Monday, um, but she will see her at her cousin, um, she might see her at her cousin Watson's before then. So the day after um, this uh, visit from Mrs. Veal, she, uh, Mrs. Bargrave is a little indisposed. It's a Sunday and she stays in bed uh, or she stays in her house. But on the Monday, she thinks I would like to see Mrs. Veal again before her journey and goes to the Watson's house to inquire after her. But the Watson's tell her that she isn't there and she hasn't been. Says, but of course she must have been. She was with me for two hours on Saturday. And I said, no, no, she, she hasn't been here at all. And she would have visited her if, she, if she'd been here. And then as they're talking, Mr. Watson comes into the house and delivers the news that Mrs. Veal died on the 7th, on the Friday. Mrs. Bargrave exclaims and tells them all about the meeting on the 8th. And she describes in detail, uh, details about the clothes, which um, uh, the, Mrs. Watson says, you couldn't possibly have known that. Only she and I knew about that. You wouldn't have seen it. So there's this question um, of 
whether she saw the ghost and it seems very likely but Mr Beale the brother is is unwilling to let this story spread because he thinks it's a sort of perhaps a stain on the character of his sister that she returned as a ghost which is an interesting uh, sort of tie-in with our discussion there in the in the chat but as you can see from this tale what we're finding is is definitely not a narrative of fear. We're finding a sort of quite emotional and effective story, one which is grounded in an interest in um, Christian consolation. But some of the features of it, which are really important in terms of thinking about how this uh, maps the pattern that we're going to see in later real life cases, is the way in which um, people start to combat this story and defend it. And so you found in the introduction, as I've already illustrated, this appeal to testimony about reliable witnesses, about further evidence, about little facts that she couldn't possibly have known. But on the other side, you have questions about um, the reliability of the witness, um, the fact that Mrs. Bargrave is wanting to make herself important, the brother suggests, the unwillingness of people to um, believe in the possibility of spirits, the potential that this was a, um, a demon, perhaps, is why Mr. Veal um, is so unwilling to have it. Uh, it suggested that the sister was visiting, that it might be a demonic form impersonating her, or it might suggest uh, some things about her character that she was able to return as a ghost. I'm not quite sure what. Um, so you're seeing uh, a lot of different reasons uh, and a lot of different reactions and some of these kind of modalities of response, which we're going to see in response to real life cases. So let me take you to two real life cases. We're going to look at both of them from about the same period. The most famous of them is of course, the Cockling Ghost from 1762, which many of you will have heard of. And then we're going to look at the Lambs in Poltergeist and Possession from 1761 to 1762. So let me tell you a story and I'd like you to come on a journey with me and imagine. So I want you to imagine that you are a 13 year old girl lying in your small pokey room in a London house in the mid 18th century at night. As you're laying in the dark, you hear beside your head a scratching on the wall or behind the wall or in the wall. You don't know what it is, perhaps it's rats. But then you hear the noise again from a different place, a place where a rat couldn't be. And then you hear it again and it's moved. And then you begin to hear during the day as well, strange sounds, scratches like a cat running its claws down the leg of a chair. Occasionally muffled thuds. And then one day you see a woman, you see a woman in a shroud with no hands. But you're not the only person who sees her. Your father also sees a woman with her hands and face glowing, as does a local publican. And it resembles a woman called Fanny Kent, who had lived in the house with her husband, William Kent. You decide to try and communicate with her using a newly devised system of knocks. So the idea is, you, you say to the ghost, we want to know who you are. We want to speak to you. We want to help you. So please knock twice for no and knock once for yes. And they ask, are you Fanny Kent? Okay. Uh, did you die a natural death? No. Did William kill you? So we have a potential tale of murder. And it's worth going back in the history to find out what happened. So William Kent was originally married to Elizabeth, who was his first wife and the sister of Fanny. Now Fanny lived with them in the house. And one day, Elizabeth died, supposedly in childbirth, and she was survived by her child, by a mere few hours. Fanny stayed in the house, subject to William Kent's persecutions. When he moved to London, he inveigled her into following him. They lived together. They couldn't marry because canon law forbade it. 
but they lived together as though they were man and wife, moving from house to house because William was an unpopular man. He fell out with people wherever he lived, he moved from one lodging to another to another, and they had lodged for a time in the house of that girl who was um, Elizabeth Parsons, whose father was Richard. They lived in the house of Richard and Elizabeth Parsons for a while, but they'd fallen out once again, or William had anyway. And although his wife, his not wife, Fanny, was pregnant, six months pregnant, he forced her to leave the house and move into pokey lodgings above a jewellery shop or in the home of a jeweller. And there she fell ill and she died. They asked the ghost, did you die of the smallpox, as they said? No. Because nobody would seen the corpse. William had been quite clear that he wasn't going to let Fanny's remaining sister see the body. They asked, were you poisoned? Was it arsenic? Yes. So this is a tale of murder, but not just a tale of murder. It's also a tale of sensation because this ghost story haunting became, became a public sensation, debated on all sides. And the house itself and the room where scratching Fanny lived or rather unlived, was a site for visitation by tourists, essentially, or people living in the city, by noblemen, by clergymen, by anyone that wanted to pay a penny to get in. And if they believed, and they went to the room upstairs, they might just hear some of the noises that Fanny made. But some people were skeptical, and a team of ghost hunters, as it were, was put together, including Samuel Johnson, and they went to the house and lo and behold, when they came to the room, there was no visitation by the ghost, but was it simply because they didn't quite believe? But they returned and Fanny did agree to talk to them a little bit that time. And when they said, will you meet us in your coffin? Come and show us away from little Elizabeth Parsons. Come and knock on the coffin. And she said, yes. So off they trooped to St. John Clerkenwell to the graveyard and they waited in the musty tomb in the darkness and they waited and they waited and they waited and there was no visitation at all. And so through this means, it was revealed that it was in fact an imposture. And some of you may have been sitting there thinking that's not the right story. They're telling it wrong. And I was telling it wrong, guys. I was telling you the story of what the parson said happened, but it's quite the distortion of reality. As we find laid out in The Mystery Revealed, published also in 1762 and attributed usually to Oliver Goldsmith. The story that I told you about the ghost is true. All of those things happened in that order, although debatable whether the ghost was ever seen. In fact, it wasn't. But the story about William and Fanny Kent was completely untrue. William had been in a happy marriage with Elizabeth. Fanny had moved in to help with the house um, um, and with Elizabeth's pregnancy. Elizabeth had died and Fanny had stayed on as a housekeeper and affection had grown between them. But William, knowing that he would be unable to marry her in canon law had left specifically to break up that relationship, but they'd kept in contact. And Fanny had said that she wouldn't be stopped from joining him and that she wanted to join him in London. At which point, when his friend was going up to the area, he asked him to escort her back and she came to live with him. Now, her family had been deeply upset about this um, or deeply angry about it. But instead of hiding it, had publicized this truth everywhere to the damage of their reputation. Now, there were problems for them moving between lodgings if people found out about this. But uh, more prominently, there were constant problems with landlords because William kept lending them money. So he was lending them money that they were not paying back, which he took them to court over. And he'd done this as well with Richard Parsons. And it's interesting to note that it was 
just after Richard Parsons had paid this money back, an odd pay, uh, or finally got this money, uh, paid it back to William Kent, that that's when he set up this ruse or set up the Cock Lane ghost haunting. Um, and so what you see um, is really quite a tragic story um, of Fanny and Elizabeth having to move out in, in poor conditions when she is pregnant and ill. Um, he did not, she did not die in a pokey flat uh, in a jeweler's house, but rather she was moved to the house that William had already uh, sort of set up and prepared for them as a house, a more permanent lodging. Uh, she was attended for days by a physician, um, but she died of smallpox. The coffin was open, so the sister did see, but she lied for a time about seeing that. And we also have uh, witness attestations to the fact that Fanny and William were very much in love. And so William lost uh, somebody very dear to him. And then also was really, really negatively affected, of course, by all of this publicity and the court cases involved. In the end, though, it was revealed that Richard and Elizabeth were the frauds. It was suggested that Elizabeth had been forced to participate by her father and she was um she was not punished but richard was imprisoned but it's a really interesting tale for you there guys and an interesting uh, example of how sort of the public sphere debated and understood this ghost storytelling but its popularity and the sensation that it caused suggests at least the interest there was in ghost telling if not belief so the next case um, I'm going to tell you about was occurring at a very similar time and shows us that the Cock Lane ghost was not a unique phenomena, but that you have in towns and cities all around England, some similar incidents occurring, although there was a conglomeration of them in the 1760s. Now, the Lamb Inn case in Bristol is particularly interesting and particularly well documented as Jonathan Barry goes into, um, if you're wanting to look up more about this because um, we have the work here of Henry Durbin, which was published in 1800 posthumously, um, the diaries of William Dyer, and we also have uh, the very uh, vitriolic newspaper exchanges between different interpreters of these events. So there's lots and lots of public record about this. Um, the uh, haunting took place at the Lamb Inn in Bristol with the daughters of the innkeeper, Richard Giles, Molly and Dobby. It started um, in quite a similar way to the Cock Lane Inn with scratching, but it moved on towards more symptoms of sort of poltergeist activity with furniture moving around and the girls being attacked, slapped, bitten, pricked and pinched in front of witnesses. As with uh, the Cock Lane ghost, they started to try and communicate with the spirit through knocking. Um, and um, we have uh, also attempts to communicate with the spirit um, by local uh, clergy. And there was to some extent a sort of theological uh, <laughs> turf war going on in regards to this question. Um, with Methodist, local Methodist ministers supporting the possibility and some other non-denominal uh, denominations and uh, some, uh, some, sorry, dissenting denominations and also some uh, Anglican aligned uh, preachers and then other sort of uh, Presbyterians and Unitarians being very much against this being supernatural. But you had min pri uh, priests and ministers coming to talk to the girls, to talk to the spirits, asking questions in other languages, Greek, Latin and Hebrew to which the girls often responded at random. But what's quite interesting about this uh, case is we're not only seeing the theological aspect here, but we're seeing it crossing over with folkloric beliefs because it was revealed that the spirit had been summoned, not to the preachers, but that in questioning the spirit at some point, the spirit revealed that it had been summoned by a witch from Mangot's field and had, who had been hired by a rival of Giles in his haulage business. Now, after the priests and uh, uh, religious men get involved, the possession becomes more violent. The girls are thrown from their bed so violently that it takes three grown men to, hold, to, uh, to be able to restrain them. The symptoms grew less when the girls were separated and taken into other houses, but Richard Giles himself died on the 16th of March. Now, his death was also perhaps a little bit peculiar. On the 12th of March, he had traveled home uh, on horseback and his harness had broken. As he traveled back, he had seen at the side of the road an old woman who simply stood and stared at him and did not speak at all. 
After his death, it was revealed to Durbin, the writer of this account here, that it was witchcraft that had killed him after all. So after his death, the two daughters are brought together again and the symptoms grow increasingly worse. There's all of this prayer and all of this interaction with the demon, but because it's believed at this point to be an evil spirit rather than um, a spirit of the dead ghost. Um, but their prayers are having very little effect. The haunting is not stopping. So they call in Martha Biggs, a white witch, who uses a traditional remedy for getting rid of the spirit. She's already used it to some extent before, but she takes it to the nth degree. And the remedy is boiling the girl's urine. Yep, um, in order to kill the witch or take away her power. Now, Martha Biggs appears in a number of cases of the period, including the possession of George Lukens. And she was also arrested um, for witching um, uh, or her claims to be able to identify a cow thief. So it's worth noting sort of in the legislature here um, that in the 1730s, you have the removal of the witch statutes because it was believed that witchcraft didn't exist. So sort of legally, it was understood that witchcraft didn't exist, but you could still be prosecuted for pretending to be a witch. And that's what Martha Biggs was prosecuted for, but not in this case. So there's a really interesting overlap here of theological engagement uh, and sort of learned debate, uh, but also uh, the sense of folk belief. And it was, of course, folk belief that cured the haunting. So there's a lot uh, going on in this tale, and we'll find sort of uh, interesting accounts from the period. Um, now, some of these, as I've said, uh, were from diaries. And this is an example from William Dyer talking about, oh, this is an example from Durbin talking about William Dyer about his experiences. And you see that there's quite an emphasis on uh, these sort of scary or inexplicable events. So after a short time spent in waiting, a loud knocking took place on the opposite side of the wainscot. It was at night and the place in deep darkness. Lifting his eyes towards the place where the noise seemed to be, he discovered a colored luminescent appearance of a circular form about the size of a common plate. And the colors resembled those of a rainbow. The brighter ones were extremely vivid and deeply shaded with the red, blue, and indigo. The writer believes that Mr. D said he then asked some questions, but what they were, he cannot now recollect. So you've got some elements of the tale here, but you definitely have this emphasis on the simply inexplicable in this, um, in this account. So part of the, the writing about this was this posthumously published text. Part of it we know about now through these diaries and through other private writings of the time. But there was also this whole newspaper war where people were writing in to talk about um, the possibilities of the case. Some were ridiculed for believing and engaging with this uh, spirit, going to the house so many times to see the girls and talk to the demons. Others were ridiculed for being fanatical skeptics, unwilling to accept the possibility of the supernatural. There was also sort of claims of fraud, suggestions that Richard Giles had put on the haunting in order to lower the price of the inn so that he could buy it. But he said that the inn had not even come on for sale until three months after the haunting started. And after his death, that obviously doesn't provide an explanation. So a little bit more open uh, to interpretation here with the lamin, whether you want to believe that it's real or not. The suggestions would perhaps be no, but you can still believe if you want to. Now, these cases were not the only cases at all. I don't want you to think they were. And there were other sort of publicly uh, discussed cases, such as the headless spectre of St. James's Park later on in the century. But uh, these were two of the most famous and provide kind of quite good examples of how these events could become public spectacles um, in the period. So let's take our a second break. Yes, oh, bye Angie. Um, sorry you creeped out guys. That was my spooky one, even though it's not really spooky at all. <laughs> Let me resume recording. Hope you've all had your nice little Casper moment. Folk traditions. So one thing that I find uh, really fascinating, and this is because I have my whole life been um, an enthusiast for folk music. Um, but something that I find really interesting and to some extent still understudied in Gothic studies is the interaction uh, between uh, sort of folkloric uh, tales uh, 
and ballads as they appear in the 18th century and the development of the Gothic, but also um, we often tend to ignore what is very much a living tradition, which has kept going uninterrupted from the 18th century, or from before the 18th century to the present day. So when we think about the development of the ghost story, we always we often think in terms of the written. Um, but there is a whole oral history um, and often based around music as well, but also oral storytelling, um, which is a whole whole sort of uh, not alternate, but parallel history of ghost telling. Um, so there is a really interesting intersection of the 18th centuries between folk traditions and the literary sphere or sort of educated commentary on um, ghosts. And that is the collections of people like Percy and his ancient relics of English poetry. And then in the 19th century, the child's ballads of these collections of folk ballads, um, some of which or many of which had supernatural elements. Now, these texts give a really interesting um, insight into this folk culture, but they're also a really different and interesting type of ghost telling. So one of the things that's different about them is that they're often interacting with ghost beliefs, which are archaic, um, not necessarily existent at the time of the, of the, um, in which they're, in, in which they're written down or which, in which they're being produced, sung, uh, recited. Um, these are tales which uh, bear traces of lots of different forms of ghost belief that are being reproduced. They also have a different focus. And I'll read this out with you now. And you'll see the way in which these folk traditions of ghost storytelling are not engaged in the same debates as either the anti-Sadducean literature or even the sort of real citing uh, discourse that's going on. So we're going to look at two uh, folk ballads from the period. The first of them, um, is Sweet William's Ghost. And I say from the period, but what I'm meaning by that is that they are being written down at the period. Um, but these are actually, they have a much longer history. Sweet William's Ghost dates back to at least the 16th century um, in various forms. Now, one thing to note about this is that folk traditions are fluid. But what was uh, sort of occurring in the 18th century is this, is this attempt to sort of concretize, write down a, a version as a definitive version or write down uh, this version of this is the song, this is the ballad. And often to both sort of codify and categorize these as well. Um, one of the things that I love about folk traditions is that it essentially resists this impulse. So this provides a record, of course, of a song that can be uh, sort of gifted for posterity. But this is collected as a sort of form of uh, almost antiquarianism of the collection of curiosities, an attempt to sort of fossilize or place in a glass, uh, the, the equivalent of placing something in a glass case in a museum. These folk traditions are something to study and be interested in. Whereas these folk traditions lived in the period and continue to live in forming are the narratives that we have informing the development of, uh, of Gothic literature, but also resisting that often uh, sort of condescending attempt to concretize them as a curiosity. Uh, just as a little aside there, a little bit of a moment for me. Um, but so this is uh, Sweet William's ghost. And there came a ghost to Margaret's door with many a grievous groan, and I he tiled at the pin, an answer made she none. Is this my father Philip? Or is my brother John? Or is my true love Willie from Scotland new come home? Tis not thy father Philip, nor yet thy brother John, but tis thy true love Willie from Scotland new come home. O oh, sweet Margaret, O oh, dear Margaret, I pray thee speak to me. Give me my faith and troth, Margaret, as I gave it to thee. Thy faith and troth thou never get, of me shalt never win, till that thou come within my bar and kiss my cheek and chin. If I should come within thy bower, I am no earthly man. And should I kiss thy rosy lips, thy day will not be lang. O oh, sweet Margaret, O oh, dear Margaret, I pray thee speak to me. Give me my faith and troth, Margaret, as I gave it to thee. Thy faith and troth thou never get, of me shalt never win, till thou take me to yon kirkyard and wed me with a ring. My bones are buried in a kirkyard far beyond the sea, and it is but my sprite, Margaret, that's speaking now to thee. She stretched out her lily-white hand, as for to do her best. Hey there, your faith and troth, Willie. God send your soul good rest. 
Now she has kilted her robes of green, a piece below her knee. And I, the live long winter night, the dead corpse follows she. Is there any room at your head, Willie? Or any room at your feet? Or any room at your side, Willie, wherein that I may creep? There's nay room at my head, Margaret. There's nay room at my feet. There's no room at my side, Margaret. My coffin is made so meet. Then up and crew the red, red cock, and up then crew the grey. Tis time, tis time, my dear Margaret, that I were gone away. No more the ghost to Margaret said, but with a grievous groan, vanished in a cloud of mist and left her all alone. Oh, stay, my only true love, stay, the constant Margaret cried. One grew her cheek, she closed her eyes, stretched her soft limbs and died. So typical, beautifully depressing British folk song there. But um, something that's really noticeable, I think, um, is we're moving away from that theological didacticism, right? There's reflections of older ghost beliefs. This is really returning for personal reasons. This isn't put within a providential or a theological framework here at all. But we're having a very different effective uh, sort of palette. This isn't about fear. It's not about tension. It's not about comfort. This is about tragedy. It's uh, the ghost becomes sort of meditations on, uh, on loss and love and sorrow. So this folk tradition is interested in very different things to the other 18th century manifestations that we've been talking about. So briefly, what I'm going to show you or what I'm gonna to try to show you here is a um, song. So what I love about folk music is that this song from the, this ballad from the 16th century, which just has many different forms, is still being performed today. It's still a living tradition. And by a living tradition, I mean, it's not been fossilized. It has um, not been kind of uh, dominated by that, uh, the move that we see in the romantic period towards the idea of the author as original genius and sole creator. Um, these folk traditions have uh, maintained an older conception of creativity in which one text can be uh, rewritten, reperformed, reimagined by multiple entertainers, uh, by multiple uh, artists. And what we're going to see now is we're going to listen to a version of this, this 16th century uh, folk ballad, and see how it is still being performed, changed, and each performance is itself its own uh, its own ghost telling. So um, if you just tell me if you can't hear it, we'll listen to it briefly. I hope people enjoy um, uh, and just sort of see if you can hear any of those differences as well. And capture the way in which um, also this attempt to write down these ballads takes something from them. Um, okay. Oh, I know. Let me listen to my song. There came a ghost to Margaret's door with many 
version of Sweet William's Ghost. And this is um, another uh, sort of famous song which was collected not in the Percy's Relics in 1765, but in the 19th century in Child's Ballads. But it's, if anything, even older, um, dating back to at least the 15th century. Um, and you probably have heard of this one before. It's one of the more famous kind of gothic -y ballads because it's often discussed in, to, uh, in terms of vampirism as well. But the Unquiet Grave. And what's quite useful here about the Child's Ballads version is that we have a number of different versions where um, we can interact with different versions of the, uh, the poem itself, uh, different interpretations and uh, emphases. So I'm going to read the first version and then look at some of the changes that are made in other variations. And as I say, um, I do recommend that you listen to the Kate Rusby for a change uh, that's quite major that I'll tell you about in a second. So. The wind doth blow today, my love, a few small drops of rain. I never had but one true love, and in a cold grave she was slain. She was lain. I'll do as much for my true love as any young man may. I'll sit and mourn all at her grave for a twelve month and a day. The twelve month and a day being up, the dead began to speak. Oh, who sits weeping on my grave and will not let me sleep? Tis I, my love, sits on your grave and will not let you sleep, for I crave, crave one kiss of your clay cold lips and this is all I seek. You crave one kiss of my clay cold lips, but my birth smel Beth smells earthly, earthy strong. If you have one kiss of my clay cold lips, your time will not be long. Um, Tis down in yonder garden green, love where we used to walk. The finest flower that e'er was seen is withered to a stalk. The stalk is withered dry, my love, so will our hearts decay. So make my, yourself content, my love, till God calls you away. So there's a couple of key points here. The return of the dead, it's uh, represented as quite physical. So you have this idea perhaps of the walking corpse, which is where the connection to vampirism is being uh, sort of elicited, but also to the sense uh, which does appear, particularly at the beginning of the 18th century of the corporeality of ghosts as they're understood. Um, again, you have this emphasis very much on tragedy and loss and coping with loss. So folk songs often narrate tragedies, but they often, uh, function as a form of catharsis arguably but also as a form of narrating uh, sort of survival of these tragedies. Now you can see uh, very clearly from the second one here that this is a, 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 an oft performed song and it often changes genders so you often have it from a female perspective you often have it from a male perspective. So here you see um, how could how cold the wind does blow my love dear love and see the drops of rain i never had but one true love in the greenwood he was slain so there's also the emphasis here on violent death um something that's interesting about this second version is at the end where it says i am afraid my pretty pretty maid your time will not be long this um idea of the uh, proximity to death um of the maid whether she kisses him or not um, you also have here um, a number of uh, sort of smaller changes in C, uh, but perhaps D is the one that changes the most. Um, as you can see from the beginning there, but uh, I really like the ending. Was uh, Flowers will fade and die, my dear, I as the tears will turn. And since I've lost my own sweetheart, I'll never cease but mourn. Lament no more for me, my love, the powers we must obey, but hoist up one sail to the wind, your ship must sail away. But again, this emphasis on the recovery of loss. Um, the interesting thing about the Kate Rusby version um, is that includes, if you were not my own true love, I'd tear you up in pieces small as leaves upon the tree. So there's also the potential threat of the ghostly other. So I have basically finished but I did have a final slide, so I'm gonna show it to you just because I can. Um, so this uh, is one of the versions that we could have listened to if we'd had time, but we didn't. So, all finished. Um, that's the end um, of the discussion, but hopefully it's been a bit of a whistle stop tour through how ghost stories and ghost tales are appearing in lots of different guises in the 18th century. Um, if people are interested in more discussion of these kind of folkloric traditions, I see will be taking us through some folklore of uh, the British Isles in January. Um, but also uh, I will 
I'm very willing to do a talk on the intersection of folk music and the Gothic. <laughs> um, so there you go. That's it from me.